Hello everyone! Welcome if you've just logged in to the Pet Partners Facebook Live. I'm Maura Smith and we're going to talk about shelter animals as therapy animals. We'll get started in just a couple of minutes. Hi Alex! Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. We're going to talk about shelter animals as therapy animals today. I'm so glad you're interested in this really important topic. It's very close to my heart. We're going to get started with just a few introductions. My name is Mora. I am on Long Island, New York, and I live with my three cats, Wayne, Mozart, and Marty. Go ahead and chime in with where you're from and what animals you live with. Hi, Ashley. We have our chapter director from Arizona joining us. We have Kathy from Lafayette, Louisiana, with Abby, a rat terrier. Oh, we have a New Yorker. Hi, Carrie. Thank you for joining us. We have Lori from Kansas City. She's got a multi-animal household, two dogs and a cat. Welcome, Lori. Okay, the attendees are starting to level off, so I'm going to get started with what we're supposed to talk about today, which is therapy animals and rescue animals, or rescue animals and shelter animals as therapy animals. So I am glad to see that so many of you are interested in the topic that's so very close to my heart. I began my journey with my pet partner uh, animal when I adopted my orange tabby Wayne from the ASPCA animal shelter in New York City. That's where I used to work before I joined pet partner staff. I'm a former shelter person who is now an animal assisted interventions person. And I look forward to telling you more about how these two fields intertwine. Same as most of you, uh, we at Pet Partners have been diligently searching for silver linings during the pandemic. One of the early ones that made the news and warmed our hearts were the reports of increased pet adoption rates. Increasing levels of social isolation and time at home were a tipping point for many people who decided to add a new furry friend to their home. Welcome to those of you who are just joining us. Have any of you adopted a pet in the last three months? Um, how is the bonding and training going? We just got a phone call interruption. I've had a sick child this week, so that's why my phone is still on. He's all good now. <laughs> Excuse me. So did anybody have a new pet recently? Did your change in lifestyle inspire you to go out there and Give an animal a home. I can tell you that I adopted a new animal, but unfortunately it's not a perspective therapy animal. It's a reptile, a blue tongue skink. He lives here on my desk. And there's also a big black and white cat next to me, so I might get video bombed at one point. His name is Mozart. All right, so for those of you who are considering a new pet, um, and if your new pet has what it takes, here are a few things that you should know. Since its inception in the early 1990s, the Pet Partners Therapy Animal Program has operated on the principle that every animal is an individual. 
There are no requirements based on breed or physical appearance. Mixed breeds and shelter animals are welcome if they meet our standards of infection prevention, skills, and aptitude. In 2016, I contributed to the writing of the new official position statement that you can find on petpartners.org, and we'll also post it here in the comments for your review. To summarize, we support and encourage adopted animals from shelters or rescues becoming registered therapy animal teams. Every animal is an individual, skills can be taught, and aptitude is based on animals' unique inherent temperament, not origin or pedigree. Most homeless animals are adolescents or adults, which is an advantage because a mature animal's inherent temperament is fully formed and pretty stable. In other words, you, get what you, you see what you get. You get what you see. Reputable organizations will perform a behavior assessment before making an animal available for adoption, and they take some time to get to know their charges so that they can make appropriate matches for adopters. And here is Mozart joining us. He's very happy that he was adopted from the ASPCA, but he is not a therapy animal candidate. Um, as our CEO, Annie Peters, likes to say, we are the serious therapy animal organization. All of our policies and positions are well-reasoned and evidence-based, and this one is no exception. According to the American Pet Products Association, about one-fifth of all pet dogs in the United States are from shelters or rescues. Among our registered teams, it's the same proportion. That means that animals from rescues and shelters have similar aptitude and passing rates as their counterparts from breeders and other sources. Now that I've mentioned the sticky subject of breeders and other sources, I'd like to take a moment to address an unfortunately common experience I've had with people, both as an evaluator and an animal welfare professional. I meet someone and I ask them about their dog and suddenly they look embarrassed and flustered. Then they start apologizing to me that they got their dog from a breeder or a pet store, assuring me that next time they'll get a rescue. As a pet partner's team evaluator, I only care about how you treat your dog now and that you're committed to caring for them for their entire life. I've been an animal welfare uh, advocate and professional animal person for many years, and even I have some horror stories um, from before I knew better. You don't know what you don't know. Our goal in both the animal welfare and therapy animal communities is to build bridges, not barriers. So let's all just forgive ourselves and each other and commit to learning how we can do better in the future. If you want to learn more about the cool breeding industry, I recommend the ASPCA's Bard from Love campaign. Don't worry, unlike their fundraising commercials, you will not be subjected to images of animal cruelty. It's actually a really well-produced little, little video that um, will be posted in the, the comments, a link. Uh, so do we have any questions at the moment about what I've talked about so far, our position statement? Oh, we have a person from Buffalo. Hi, Paula, I'm from Buffalo. In Hawaii, I wasn't scrolling. My hand is occupied by my cat. Many animals can be great therapy animals, yes. They all require a little bit of training, but uh, it's temperament that's really important. We have someone, Christine, who's going to adopt a cat. Good for you, Christine. Fourteen cats! Oh my gosh. <laughs> Question... Okay, yeah, I can do a quick primer on um, ESA and service animal. What we're talking about today are therapy animals. People volunteer to share their animals with facilities in their community. There's no special rights of access. The difference between a therapy animal and the other types is that therapy animals serve other people, whereas an emotional support animal and a service animal serve one person. That's the really brief version of that. You can learn more on our website, petpartners.org, under terminology. <laughs> All right, I caught up on that. Uh, so in the spirit of learning, Let's get some of these myths and misunderstandings out of the way. First, 
As many of you are already attesting, you know that shelter animals are not damaged goods. Uh, the majority of shelter animals end up homeless through no fault of their own. They are victims of human circumstance. If they were given up for behavior issues, it was likely normal behavior of an, an energetic uh, juvenile or adolescent that can be remedied with a commitment to a positive reinforcement-based training plan. Another one is that um, a lot of people assume that every animal that is in a shelter is from a situation of cruelty, and that's simply not true. Most shelters simply act as a safety net or last resort for people who can no longer keep their pets. Um, most were not cruelty seizures, and the adoption facility should be able to tell you if they are. A related point is that um, fearful or aggressive behavior is not necessarily an indication of abuse. It could be poor socializing when they were young, or it's just a personality quirk. You have a particularly sensitive or fearful animal, and they were always going to be that way. Um, I have a confession to make. This may sound like blasphemy to many of you, but I am not a fan of puppies. As an animal care technician, I was responsible for keeping 21 or more of them clean for eight hours a day for four to six week stretches at a time. <laughs> if you have been through that and you still love puppies, good for you. I find them too energetic, too destructive, and the pre-house pre -house training days are just disgusting. Um, give me a dignified gray muzzle any day. Older animals are so much more adaptable and forgiving than we give them credit for. There is no correlation between the strength of the bond and the age at which you were, uh, they were adopted. And of course, yes, you can teach an old dog new tricks, you just have to be creative and figure out what motivates them. The only real difference between mixed breed and pedigree is a family tree. Yes, there are tendencies within a particular breed, like uh, you're going to have a really hard time getting a bloodhound's attention once he's on a scent. But every animal is an individual, and breed is not a reliable predictor of aptitude for therapy animal work. Again, our data backs this up. The second most numerous breed registered with us is Mix, which is tied with Yellow Lab and Golden Doodle. I also have a personal anecdote related to this. Uh, last fall, I had the privilege of evaluating a group of 12 Newfoundlands over two days. Not only were they all pedigree Newfies, but they were from the same breeder. So all these dogs were related. What was their passing rate? Around 60%, which is the same as the national average. Uh, Newfoundlands are renowned for their calm and gentle nature, which they did have, but that's not all, not all that's necessary to be a pet partner's therapy animal. All this is just to say, please don't waste your time and money or your friend's time and money on thousands of dollars and hours of raising and training a puppy because of a bogus marketing claim that a particular breed is made for therapy animal work. There is one exception to this advice, which I'll go get to in a minute. Um, some people don't want to go to an animal shelter because it's too sad. Animal shelters can be loud, and sometimes they're smelly depending on your timing. But I assure you there's a lot less sadless, sadness and fear than you think. First, the staff and volunteers should be welcoming and friendly. After all, you're there to help them achieve their miss miss mission of finding uh, the animals a home. They work extremely hard to make sure every animal is as comfortable and happy as possible. The sad part is not their surroundings, it's that they don't have a human of their own yet. There are a lot of common sense ideas in this field uh, that are well-intentioned but actually have the opposite effect. One of them is this myth about fee-waived adoptions and um, giving uh, adopted pet as a gift. There is no data to support the idea that adopted animals, that animals were adopted for free or given away as gifts are more likely to be returned. There's actually been surveys done on this and the bond is just as strong for um, animals that were uh, adopted at any price. The bond doesn't uh, matter no matter the price tag. Another one is that black dogs have a harder time getting adopted. This one is just due to our misperception of the numbers. Uh, there happen to be more black dogs in the population, but having a black coat does not decrease the chances of a black dog getting adopted. Unfortunately, there is a slight effect with black cats due to superstition. Uh, was any of this new or interesting to you? Do you have any other myths, myths to share that you've heard about uh, adopting a homeless pet? <laughs> uh, 
Um, I would say that the one thing about Golden Retrievers is that there are just so dang many of them that it's hard to say anything consistent about their temperament. Uh, one thing I've noticed in my own experience, don't take this as fact, uh, is that Golden Retrievers tend to have a harder time socializing with other dogs. They might be super friendly with people, but they're like not a fan of the dog park. Something that I've just learned over the years. Ooh, a rescue, a hurricane rescue. Yeah, there's a lot of um, mixed breed shelter dogs that get transported from disasters all over the country. A lot of them get transported from the south or places with uh, pet overpopulation problems to the north and the northeast where there's a higher uh, demand for adoption. Those are some of my favorite guys to see at evaluations. They're called transport mutts. Oh yeah, I'm a huge pit bull advocate. Pit bulls are dogs just like any other dog. Um, there's no higher, inherent higher risk based on any kind of evidence of them being aggressive towards people. Again, they might have a little issue with other dogs, um, but they are no more factually dangerous than any other breed of dog. Aww. Janine just adopted a new dog and thinks she might be a good candidate. Good for you, Janine. Yes, the photographer part of that, there is something to that, that if there is an effect, it's not because the dog is black, but because you can't see the dog's face. So you have to find a really good photographer who can take pictures of uh, black animals to really highlight their face. Hi, Carol. Carol's another one of our New York teams. Uh, we do allow service animals and emotional support animals to join pet partners, but there are a few things you should keep in mind when you're doing your training. If your animal is especially focused on you, you need to figure out a command to give them so they know when it's okay to say hello to other people. Um, but we do allow ESAs and service animals to join us. If you think they have very um, strong ingrained training related to their role, go ahead and give us a, a chat. Uh, contact us and we'll, we'll see if you need an accommodation or what kind of things you need to do in order to pre prepare to pass the test. <laughs> People often say that chihuahuas are more fierce than pit bulls. I have no comment. <laughs> Okay, the next section. All right, so you've probably signed up for this event because you're currently, you recently adopted an animal or you're currently considering adopting a new pet. Hooray for you. Uh, thank you for making adoption your first option. Is this your first time, if this is your first time acquiring a pet this way, here's a little primer on the options. Um, what I'm about to describe is a broad overview. I realize that I'm speaking in generalizations. Facilities and organizations in your community may operate differently. Companion animal welfare organizations generally fit into two broad categories, shelters and rescues. Shelters are brick and mortar buildings that house and care for animals um, and uh, homeless animals and strays. They're semi-public institutions whose primary mandate is to protect public safety by keeping strays off the street. Their mission is to adopt out as many animals as possible. Now, I have a little soapbox moment about vocabulary here. Uh, if you could all please stop using the terms high kill and no kill, myself and my animal welfare colleagues would really appreciate it. These terms are misleading and disparage the good work that these people do and creates unnecessary infighting when we're all supposed to be on the same team. In fact, there's no such thing as a no-kill shelter. Um, they should be called open admission, meaning they take in every animal that comes to their door, so they must euthanize to prevent overcrowding and neglect, or they're called limited admission, which means that when they're full, they can turn people away. If you want to reduce the number of animals euthanized in shelters, please adopt from an open admission shelter. These are usually your municipal shelters, also known as the pound or animal control. 
Um, if you'd rather not go to a shelter or are looking for an animal with fewer unknowns or have your heart set on a particular breed, a rescue may be for you. Rescues are usually smaller organizations that include a network of individual foster homes. Their mission is more focused on quality of matches than the quantity of animals. They're more likely to have an in-depth screening process for adopters, but they can give you a much more detailed picture of the pet's personality and behavior in a home. It will probably take you longer to find a therapy animal candidate if you opt for the rescue route, because these animals are often those who couldn't hack it in the shelter. They're still great pets, but they may be on the shyer or more sensitive side. Another way to identify a potential therapy animal candidate without promoting more breeding is to look into released service dogs. These dogs were already bred and raised to have good temperaments and have, should have completed all of their basic obedience training. This is, op this is an option that I mentioned earlier when I said don't spend thousands of dollars. This is the exception. These dogs are expensive, but that's because breeding, raising, and training service dogs is expensive. If you're feeling philanthropic or you don't want to start from scratch with your training, check out the member list of Assistance Dogs International to see if there are any uh, adoptable dogs near you. Does anybody have any questions about your options for locations and organizations when searching for an animal? Uh, Petfinder.com is one of the bigger and better known online databases. You can get started there. Um, there's some questions about training a cat. Uh, fortunately, cats don't have to do all the skills that dogs do. You just should make sure that they're okay with being in a harness and that they're capable of staying calm and happy when they have to leave their home to go on therapy animal visits. Xander has already heard this discussion about no kill versus high kill. Thank you, Xander. Uh, training in general helps animals become more confident. Make sure it's a positive reinforcement based training. You don't want to train your animal based on physical force or intimidation. Training should be about building communication and relationship. Uh, I said earlier that there's uh, about 5 million animals in shelters right now, I think. Um, but the ASPC is a good resource for that. It's very easily Googleable the number of animals that are in shelters like right now I think it's something like five million in uh, dogs and three million cats um, the stories I mentioned earlier were about particular uh, locations that were seeing increases I think animal care centers of New York was one of them that had a report if you want to look that up that's the one that I remember because that's the New York City shelter and that's the community that I'm familiar with. Yeah, I am surprised that a lot of people are just learning about PetFinder. It's a pretty good resource. They're they're kind of like the OG. They've been around for a long time. Uh, okay. So, now that you've figured out where you're going to start your search, here's how to increase your chances of identifying a good candidate. First, don't assume that the volunteer or staff person assisting you knows what you mean by therapy animal. Be prepared to educate them about what a therapy animal is and does and your intentions for your future pet. As you browse through the available animals, remember <laughs> that temperament is the primary factor which makes it a successful therapy animal, not appearance. Try not to get enthralled with whoever's most striking or cute. Ask to see the animals who are most calm and friendly. Those who are approved for families with small children and for first time owners are your best bet. Those are your two kind of keywords to ask about. These are the animals that get adopted quickly, so inquire or arrive early on a weekday if you can. Uh, if you want to adopt a more high needs animal, consider what I call diamonds in the rough. If you like training, look for that rowdy adolescent dog who needs to learn his manners but loves everybody he meets. Or look for a pet who's sweet as pie but has been looked over because they have missing parts or scars. And of course, don't forget the seniors. <clears throat> there are plenty of gray muzzles out there that would love to join you on visits for at least a couple of years before they enter full retirement. We have no maximum age for enrollment. Pet Partners also uh, welcomes differently abled pets. 
With one of these animals, you may need to take the extra step of requesting an accommodation before the evaluation. Just use the contact us form on our website or ask your local evaluator for more information before you sign up. Pet Partners requires that you know your animal for at least six months before you can take the team evaluation. We want you to get a good understanding of your animal's likes, dislikes, preferences, and triggers. In order to be an effective and safe therapy animal handler, you need to be able to read your animal's cues and body language really well. Learning their language takes time. If you can take them to several different places outside your home and facilitate as many positive introductions to strangers as possible, by the end of six months, you should be able to answer confidently all the sections of the handler questionnaire. That's one of the steps in the team evaluation. In addition, therapy animal visiting can be stressful for your pet, especially when they first get started. It will be much easier for them to cope and to learn to really enjoy themselves if they have a bond with their handler and can trust their human to protect and take care of them. One of the acronyms you'll learn as a handler is Yayaba. You are your animal's best advocate. You become their best advocate by getting to know them really well in lots of different settings and scenarios and by always striving to make interactions and new experiences as pleasant and fun as possible for them. Although you may get, be eager to get started, don't push them beyond their limits because that will erode the necessary trust. The people who can be slow and patient often have the longest and most successful careers as pet partners. Do we have any questions? Ooh, you, Janice has a friend who's a trailblazer and is breaking out into the rescue dog world. Hopefully she'll start a trend. Rohani asks a really good question. How do you address animals from the shelter with a history of trauma? Are they good candidates as therapy animals? Uh, what would be the best approach? So one of my like gold ticket, like top of the pyramid items when I ran the therapy animal program at the ASPCA was to find um, a candidate, a rescued pit bull from our NYPD cruelty partnership who could be a therapy animal. And I so was so happy that I found one before I had to leave the program. Um, sometimes there are animals that have been through horrible situations and they actually come out and they're okay. Um, they, not all animals experience trauma the same way. And a lot of them are of a heck of a lot more resilient than you might think a lot more resilient than humans are. So a history of trauma is not an automatic disqualifier. Um, as you may know, animals live in the present. So look at the animal in front of you and try not get to get too bogged down in their history. Uh, it is entirely possible that an, an animal that is rescued from severe cruelty or neglect could still be very happy, have a good temperament, be generally friendly, outgoing, brave, and be okay. Um, other than that, animals who are um, easily frightened or insecure for any reason, positive reinforcement based training, developing a rapport and communication, developing a good routine. There's a whole bunch of resources about um, helping raise an animal's confidence in general for life, just to make life easier for you as the pet owner. And all that stuff uh, applies for preparing to be a therapy animal as well. Yes. Um, Rescues often do pull from shelters. That's a good point. Thank you, Shauna. Uh, there's a really good shelter rescue partnership in a lot of communities. Um, someone went through the training uh, at PetSmart. Good for you, Paula. Uh, PetSmart, when they were developing their uh, therapy dog training program, they actually consulted with us pet partners about the standards that they should teach their students. Um, it's not a pet partners course, but they were informed by us. We were their subject matter experts when they were developing their course.
Anything else about? I'm seeing a lot of stories about people who have rescue animals that became therapy animals, and that warms my heart. Thank you so much. Um, that's what I ended up doing with Wayne, my cat, who of course is not joined us. He's a cat. Are there any other questions, things you want to know about pet partners? We have some time if you're interested. How long is Pet Partners Therapy Dog training? We do not have therapy dog training of our own. We ask our handlers to seek out their own um, resources and process for training because we know there's a huge variety of options. There are handlers who might want to train their own dogs and there are handlers who might want to go through um, training with a professional and we want to make that uh, as open to our handlers as possible. We want to make things um, fit the widest variety of people. We want to be as open access as possible. So part of that is not having a strict training requirement. Your animal needs to know their basic obedience skills. Uh, they need to be able to walk well on a leash um, and they need to be generally under control and responsive to you. So any training regimen that achieves those goals and enables you to communicate with your animal in a positive and friendly manner, go for it. Right, so if you have adopted an animal and you've noticed that they have a specific trigger, you should work with a professional to develop a plan um, to help them desensitize to that trigger. Um, most, It's kind of like a doctor-patient relationship or a lawyer-client relationship. I can't speak to your specific situation without knowing your animal. So one of the things I really want to highlight about going to a shelter or rescue and choosing an animal is to really think about those young, rambunctious, exuberant guys. Um, those were often my favorites to identify at the shelter when that was part of my job. Um, the animals that were just ready for life. They wanted to say hi to everyone they meet. They weren't afraid of anything, um, but they were balls of energy. Um, and these were usually young pit bulls, so they, <laughs> if you didn't have them under control, they were so strong that they were hard to handle. But they were friendly, they were safe. Um, so I would really strongly encourage you to, if you meet a dog and you're looking for a therapy animal, and they jump up on you, um, that's fine. You can train them not to do that. That doesn't automatically dis you know, disqualify them from becoming a therapy animal. Just Try to remember the things that are part of their inherent temperament versus something you can teach them to do or not to do. Um, and we have, I think it's in Arizona, we have a blind cat. We have an eyeless cat. It was incredible. We had one here in New Jersey, which I think she's passed away by now. Her name was Evangeline. Um, so there are a lot of cats that go into shelters, especially as kittens. They get a really common um, eye infection, and unfortunately the solution is surgery. Um, but especially if they, it happens from a, a young age, they grow up completely blind, but they're perfectly okay. Um, so if we could have more blind cats, eyeless cats, in our therapy animal program, I think that would be pretty cool. Uh, there are stories of animals who are uh, burn victims, who are missing limbs, who then go and visit people in rehab centers that are recovering from similar injuries, and they can be so impactful to those people. They help motivate them to participate in their rehabilitation. It's really awesome. Right, so cats. Uh, the big challenge with cats is that they need to be taken out of their home in order to participate in this work. And that's a big hurdle for a lot of cats. Um, so if you can, start training them to be okay coming with you to places outside your home. And that means training them to be okay with a harness and training them to be okay with riding in a carrier. Those are your two big go training goals for cats is harness and carrier, staying calm outside their home. Um, everything else is just, you know, knowing what their triggers and likes and dislikes are and trying to set them up for success and make sure that they're happy on the visit.
Oh, one-eyed chihuahua. Very cute. Yeah, we've had animals who are deaf visit people who are deaf. It's really... The connections you can make are really incredible when you bring an animal with a disability into a facility. Um, that's one of the things we really loved about being able to have uh, survivors of cruelty become therapy animals. It was a really great testament to resilience, and it kind of encouraged the people they were visiting to also be resilient and help them recover from whatever challenges they were facing. Yes, every pet partners volunteer has to complete their handler course. It's a requirement, it's a required step in the team registration. So Pet Partners grants uh, $500 million general liability coverage once you become registered. That covers um, you while you're on a Pet Partners visit, so long as you're following all the rules and policies and procedures. Um, you are welcome and encouraged to take on additional homeowners insurance. You can find out more about insurance on our website, petpartners.org. But yes, part of the reason that you go through this registration process and you pay your registration fee is that we grant you insurance coverage for your volunteer activity. Ah, Rosie Zomani retired. Yeah, Wayne retired after three and a half years. He was on the very sensitive end of the scale. He was barely able to tolerate um, taking the bus, which is what we had to do when we lived in Queens. And so he kind of reached a point where he wasn't recovering from his bus ride when we got to the facility, and I decided to retire him. So he's taken on a second career as a foster mentor when I have foster cats in the house. He's kind of the guy that chills them out and tells them it's all okay. Uh, every animal is the same registration and testing process, regardless of whether they're an emotional support animal or service animal. They all have to, everybody takes the same test. That was grandma calling to learn about my son. <laughs> He's fine. Oh, gosh. Not being able to visit. So... I have the fortune of having a cat. I haven't had to deal with a dog who's used to the routine of going out. Wayne is very happy in his retirement. Um, I can tell you that, you know, you can take her out to dog-friendly places to see people. You can take her, you know, like Home Depot has, you know, is pet-friendly. I've heard that Barnes & Nobles is pet-friendly. Let her interact with your neighbors, you know. Some alternative that's not in a, in a facility with, you know, vulnerable and hurting people. Um, something nearby your house, something very short-lived, like ways for her to interact that are just less intense and easier than what was a, a formal visit. Um, and you're welcome to participate in World's Largest Pet Walk at the end of September. Honey will probably have a blast at that. And anyone is allowed to participate, anyone who's a friend of Pet Partners. Permission to ride public transportation. Um, as with all cases of asking for permission to go places with your pet, you have to make sure that there's someone who uh, is in a position of power who is interested in making it happen. So unfortunately, you're going to have to work on uh, your network and see if you can get to connected to someone who has influence with whatever agency. Otherwise, it's kind of a crapshoot. Um, 
there was a girl in New Jersey who got permission to bring her dog on the bus. And that was amazing. Um, I don't know if that relationship still exists, but basically it's a lot of work. It's like doing, you know, political advocacy and lobbying. You're going to have to get in touch with whoever the people are in charge of the agency that you want to use and try to make your case. If you want to get in contact with us, we can send you all the information about, you know, pet partners and our standards, but ultimately they still have to grant permission. Uh, therapy animals don't have rights of public access. Yes, Principal Sarah Pelly is uh, talking about getting creative during COVID. There are a number of teams who have gone to facilities and done socially distanced versions of their visits. We also have um, virtual visit resources available. If you just go to petpartners.org and search virtual, you'll find a, both a guide for handlers and a guide for facilities. There are lots of different ways that you can continue to keep offering this wonderful beneficial activity without being in person if that's not an option for you. Thank you, Mozart. Mozart just knocked something off my desk. Yeah, a lot of people are doing it through Windows. Hmm, Xander, that is a good question. Uh, if your dog is able to lay down at all, it doesn't matter what command or cue or signal you use, so long as there's some way to communicate to your animal that they need to lay down. Um, we get questions about that a lot. People train their animals differently. So long as it's um, not by physical force, you know, that's okay. Um, we're going to have to get creative to figure out how we can get your service animal to down. Yes, animals, most of our animals have to be at least one year before they can join pet partners. Um, the pocket pets, the rats and guinea pigs only have to be six months. I'm not sure what the age for rabbits is. They're always in between. Um, Yes, most of our animals have to be one year of age before you can enroll in pet partners. We do not allow treats on the evaluation, unfortunately, um, because we need to see that the animal is motivated by their handler's instructions and by interacting with people not receiving treats. Yes. Good point, Paula. If you know of an animal-friendly place, it's still always a good idea to call them first before you bring your animal. So just to double check. <laughs> Are there any other questions? We're going to wrap it up in a few minutes. I hope you guys all have an idea of what your local shelter and rescue options are. Are you familiar with whoever your local pound is? Whoever someone might call the high kill shelter, but is actually open admission? Please, you know, one thing that we'd really like it if you would do when you're done with this uh, is go find out what facility that is and see how you can help them. Those are the guys that really need your help. I volunteered in a uh, long-term care facility, a senior facility in Queens. We went um, every Tuesday afternoon for three and a half years. It was great. We had, we visited, so like I said, Wayne is on the really sensitive end of the spectrum, so he was only able to do one-on-one -on -one visits, so we would go room to room and visit about five or six people every Tuesday. And that's all we did. And that was fine. Uh, I'd know that he was really happy when I would place him on somebody's lap. Well, first, most of the time I'd go into a room and I'd have him on my lap, and I'd start by introducing myself and talking to the person. And then a couple of times we had these really great moments where I would have been meeting someone for the first time, and I'd say, you know, we're here for the first time, you're welcome to pet him on my lap. 
Um, he may or may not get closer to you just because this is the first time we're here. You know, don't take it personally. He's still happy to see you. And then for some reason, he always knew when somebody really needed it and he would climb off my lap and onto the person's bed and snuggle with them. And they loved it when he would do the little like shimmy down and, and snuggle into a ball and just sit there and be petted for 20 minutes. Okay, I think that's all for now. I hope you all have a good evening. Give your, your pets a hug. Check out some of the online databases. Get in contact with your local shelter. Ask them questions about their adoption process. Um, if you have any questions, we'd be happy to hear from you. Good luck. Have a good night.